have been asked to talk about the prophetic aspects of the autumn feast. Now that's rather difficult to do if we don't know what the prophetic meaning is of the previous. And so I'm just going to talk about for a, a few minutes about that. Now Leviticus 23 will be my key chapter. And as you read through the chapter you'll find that the first thing that it mentions is that these are prophetic seasons. Now I take that from the word Moet, which in Genesis 18.4 means appointed time. And so God has appointed times for us to have Mikhaot, holy convocations, holy gatherings and festivals. But some of these are specific prophetic seasons or times. Now Leviticus 23 is the chapter where they are laid out chronologically for us and God says this is my prophetic calendar. Now the first one that he deals with is the Sabbath and the Sabbath prophetically in Matthew 12 8 is connected to Yeshua because he is the Lord of the Sabbath and therefore in him we have rest. Yeshua is the Sabbath rest and that particularly relates to the Millennial Kingdom as we take it from Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9. And then he repeats the instructions that these are the appointed seasons of the Lord Holy Convocations. In other words he starts that whole thing again in verse 4 and he does this because now come the annual celebrations and these are distinct. And amongst these are the Passover the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we then have the First Fruits and Shavuot. Now, as I indicated, time eludes me, but Passover, the prophetic significance is that Yeshua is the Passover Lamb. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin. But particularly in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 to 8, the Shiliach uh, Shaul, or the Apostle Paul, makes a reference saying, for Messiah our Passover has been slain. Therefore let us celebrate the festival without leaven. And so he is our Passover. That's the key. We then come to the second feast. And the second feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Chacham Atzot in Hebrew. And the reference for the prophetic element is in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 11 to Hebrews 10 18 where we see it talks about the sinlessness of Messiah's sacrifice with his sinlessness uh, he brings with his sinless life he brings a sinless sacrifice and is able to cleanse the heavenly tabernacle remove the sins of the older testament saints and makes an application for the blood for the newer testament saints and so there are three things that are connected there but it is about his sinless sacrifice that he made. We then come to first fruits, and first fruits is explained in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 23. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. Now he's not the first one to rise from the dead, but he's the first of the permanent resurrected saints. So since by man death came, also by man the resurrection from the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Messiah all are made alive. But each in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, and then those at his coming. Now in our last conference we talked a lot about Shavuot, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on Shavuot, but the Feast of Pentecost, as it is commonly known, the Feast of Weeks. It was the giving of the law when Israel became a nation. They went from tribes to nationhood. And that included the giving of the law that bound them together, Exodus 19. But when they received it, 3,000 died, Exodus 32. And so as a counterpart, we see that the Holy Spirit fell on Shavuot, on Pentecost in Acts 2. And the Torah was written on their heart. The law was written on their heart. Jeremiah 31 verses 33. And 3,000 became alive on that day. And so those have already been fulfilled. 
then come to Leviticus 23 verse 22 where it talks about the harvesting of your land that's an old reference to put in the middle of a festival chapter or feast chapter and that's because the prophetic element still fits you see the first three festivals were about Messiah Messiah the Passover lamb Messiah's sinless sacrifice Messiah the first fruits of the resurrection and then the creation of the body of Messiah of the Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot but what is the body to do they are to lift up their eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for the harvest John 4 33 in other words they are to go out and share the good news of Messiah and so now we come to the autumn feast or the autumn festivals which would be a better term and they start off what is commonly known in Christian circles as the Feast of Trumpets. Though that's not very accurate. In Jewish circles it's Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, and that too is not very accurate. You see, in Leviticus 23, Moses is told, You shall have a reminder of blowing a holy convocation. Now what is the blowing all about? It doesn't specify what they are to blow. In Numbers 29 we see the sacrifices that are to be made for it. In, Numbers, sorry, in Nehemiah 8 it mentions that this feast was observed during the reading of the law. Now biblically speaking this was called Yom Truah, the day of blowing. And the blowing in particular was not of a trumpet, a silver trumpet, but of a shofar. Yom Teruah, or Rosh Hashanah, is also known as Yom Atzikaron, the Day of Remembrance, when Jewish people are, re are asked to recall their sin. And it's Yom Hadin, one of the two days of judgment, the other being Yom Kippur. God will judge and starts judging at this point in time. As such, we need to remember our sins. The Jewish people on this day blow the shofar, and I hope that my colleague already talked about that. The significance of the ram's horn relates to the, the akeda or the akida, the binding of Isaac in Genesis 22. Technically, it should be any kosher animal horn but we exclude the bovine, the cow, the bull, because of the golden calf incident. And we blow it so as to cause all Israel to know that he is the Lord. Now, on this day, we have three different notes that we blast. On this day, we have three different sounds of the shofar. The tekiah, shepherim, truah. And they're intermixed backwards and forwards for a total of 99 sounds. Now they're not all played at once. There are some at the beginning of the service, some in the middle and some at the end. And so there are distinct times to sound them. The final blast is also a tekiah, but a tekiah kodola, meaning the great blast or the great trump. And from this we get the term the final trump. Now there are two prophetic elements within this feast. The first prophetic element is seen in Isaiah 27 verse 13 where Israel is being recalled by the Lord to come back to the land of Israel. This is a significant passage because like the various shofar sounds in the synagogue there are stages at which they are played so too the various aliyahs came at stages, the various regatherings of Israel came during various times. The second prophetic aspect is seen in 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 to 18. In verse 16 it says that the Lord himself, that's the Lord Yeshua, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Now note that it's Messiah himself who will descend from heaven. That's where he currently is. And he will issue, and most translations will say shout, it's a military command. 
this is repeated by the archangel and then that is repeated by the trump of God and those that are in Messiah shall rise first and so it seems that the Lord himself is saying something like come come up here come up now this is repeated by the archangel and we know there is only one from scripture that's Michael and the trump of God who will be sounded and those who died in Messiah will come at that point a similar passage is found in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 15 to 58 but it, it's beyond my time limit to really deal with this but let me read to you verse 52 in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump the trump shall be sounded and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we should all be changed it is at that point that we will put on incorruption and immortality and this is the being caught up moment when we are snatched up a common term for this is the rapture when living saints are caught up to be with the Lord now there are some who say this relates again to the trump of revelation but that cannot be revelation isn't written yet so that's impossible paul is writing from his own jewish background and knowing that within the synagogue there was a final trump at the last of the the surface the concluding of the surface therefore that's the trump that he's referring to he doesn't know yet about the trump of revelation so this feast has two prophetic elements. We then come to the next feast, or holy seasons perhaps better, which is Yom HaKippurim. Yes, you heard that right. It's the Day of Atonement. It's in plural. This is found in Leviticus 23 verses 26 to 32. And there we see that atonement was to be made on behalf of the nation but verse 29 if there's any person who will not humble himself on the cell on the same day he shall be cut off from his people while the whole day is being described in Leviticus 16 the key for this whole procedure is from this text is that the people must humble themselves and those who do not humble themselves before the Lord will be cut off Now Leviticus 16 is that key chapter and the, the key within that chapter is the two goats. What we see is that the high priest who normally does not enter the Holy of Holies is allowed to come in twice. He goes into the Holy of Holies first for himself with the blood of a bull and then a second time with the blood of a goat. But there are actually two goats, one for the Lord and one for Azazel. The one for the Lord is to be slaughtered. And that goat will make atonement for the nation. The other goat is sent away into the wilderness. It is the, the escape goat or the, the scapegoat and it is the goat for the removal of sin. And so the two goats, one covers the sin, the other one removes the sin. And this is a, pro a prophetic picture of what the Messiah will do for us. Now that is at that point not yet done. And so what they had to do, biblically speaking, as a nation was to afflict the soul. Because the temple no longer stands, there is no blood sacrifice at this point. Therefore, there is no atonement being made, unless the Lord has provided an alternative. The alternative is seen in Isaiah 52, verse 13 to 53, 12, commonly known as Isaiah 53. It's not just a prophecy about the crucifixion, though there is a strong element within that a second passage would be Psalm 22 but Isaiah 53 is also the the wording perhaps or the, the background to what Israel will have to do 
prophetically Israel will have to make a confession of sin. In Hosea 5:15, it says, I will go and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction. They will seek me earnestly. Once the body of Messiah is caught up to be with the Lord forevermore, the Messiah, who has gone back to his place, is waiting for Israel to acknowledge their offense. He's waiting until they seek his face. When will that happen? When they are afflicted. It is then that they will seek him. What is it that they will then confess is found in Isaiah 52:53. They will confess that he is the atonement, that he is the one who makes atonement for them. He is the sheep. Based on Zechariah 12 verses 10 to 13 verse 1, we know that this will only happen when the Spirit is poured out upon the people of Israel. It is then that they will look unto the one they have pierced and mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. That is the start of the national regeneration of Israel. And this will come because of the affliction, as we mentioned from Hosea. It is then that they make that confession from Isaiah 53. And so Yom Trua, the Feast of Trumpets, is fulfilled by Israel being regathered to the land and the snatching up of the body of Messiah. The Day of Atonement is fulfilled by the Tribulation. At the end of the Tribulation they will make that confession so we could also look forwards to the National Atonement when all Israel will acknowledge who Messiah is and therefore all Israel at that point will be saved. And so when they make that confession the next feast will come onto the scenes and that is the Feast of Tabernacles which is in verses 33 to 44 of Leviticus 23. Now I wish I had the time to read all of this but my time is limited but I hope you do read the entire chapter. Another chapter or two to read would be Numbers 28 and 29, which include all of the sacrificial aspects to the various feast days. But when we look at chapter 23 for the final feast, we see that a number of bulls are being sacrificed. And to be specific, it is the number 70. The number 70 represents the Gentile nations, and we see that in Genesis 10. And so all the nations will be needed to be connected to this feast. Now within the law we see a further connection in Deuteronomy 16 verses 13 to 15 where a special emphasis is on rejoicing. In other words, we must all come now because all of it is finished. The hard time for Israel is over. Now the Feast of Tabernacles has some background and particularly when we look at the Gospels we see a very strong connection in John, Se John chapter 7 to John 10. Most of that has as the background this particular feast. Now sometimes we read feast without any context within the Bible and it's always this feast, the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot in Hebrew, based on the Sukkah, the booth that was to be built. Now prophetically we can see in Amos chapter 9 verse 11 that God promised to rebuild the tabernacle of David. The tabernacle of David is the kingdom of David. And while David will be resurrected and he will play a role within it, we can see that in the book of Ezekiel in particular, it is not about him. It is about the Messiah who will be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so while David will be resurrected, he will only be a local ruler, the national ruler of Israel. He will not be king over all the earth. That will be to Yeshua. A 
Further connection can be found in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, verses 16 to 19. In that passage it says that all the nations will come and need to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles before the Lord year after year. And those who do not go up will have no rain. And particularly it threatens the nation of Egypt if they do not go up. Now in terms of its background, Tabernacles reminds us of the time that Israel was in the wilderness when it had left Egypt. Now God is saying they too will need to remember that time when the Lord was king over Israel. And so the Lord will be king not just over Israel but over all the earth. And therefore all the nations will need to come and worship the Lord. And so there will be a time of great rejoicing. And particularly for the nation of Israel, it'll be a time of rejoicing after the great affliction that will happen before this Selah.